Hi Dragonflies, welcome back to Dragonfly Spirit Studio. I'm Lynn Bauer. In the last video, we used a rather boring reference photo of a lighthouse and the silhouette painting strategy from an earlier video to design two different possible paintings inspired by the lighthouse photo, but not copying the photo. If you missed those two videos and want to catch up, I've put links in the description for this video. And if you did watch them and you're getting sick of this lighthouse by now, please bear with me. I want to continue with the same example for a while so you can see how these various steps might fit together from the original idea to a finished painting. And it's just way too much to put into one video. But also, please don't think of this as some sort of slow motion paint along where you wait until you have the whole series and then try to copy me step by step. You can do that if you want to, but you'll get a lot more out of it if you try to look at this as just an example and try out some of these ideas on your own paintings. If you did try to paint from the two designs we came up with last time, you may run into a few questions about how to begin. That's because a design is not a painting plan. A design is about how you want the painting to look. A painting plan is about how you're going to get there. Once you have a design you like, you still need to figure out things like how to create a roadmap for where to place things on the page, what to paint wet and wet or wet on dry, what techniques you want to use for various parts of your painting, what order to lay your washes, and one of the most difficult, how to reserve the whites and the light areas. In this video, we'll try to come up with painting plans for these two designs. One thing we'll discover is that although design one might look like a simpler painting, it actually presents some bigger challenges for how to go about reserving light areas. It's actually going to be easier to create a painting plan for design two. We'll also see how far we can get with design one so we can identify where the real problems are. And then in the next video, we'll go into more depth and look at seven different options for reserving lights and see how each one might play out if we used it in design one. Before we start working on our plans, we have a couple of decisions to make that could be considered design or planning. So we'll just stick them in between and that's size and format. Format refers to the shape of the painting. Is it squarish? Is it a long skinny horizontal? Is it a vertical rectangle or maybe something unusual like a circle or an oval? For these two examples, I decided both the size and the format ahead of time so it would all fit nicely on my video table. But normally what I do is make my first guess about format and then come up with a design and then take that design into my photo editing software and play around with cropping it in different ways to see if maybe there's a format I like even better. As far as size, I know I say this a lot, but size matters in watercolor. So before you start choosing techniques, you need to have some general idea of what size your painting is going to be. Anything you're doing that involves wet into wet effects or stamping, sponging, spattering, all those texture effects that we like, those things all happen at whatever size they're going to happen at. They don't know how big the piece of paper is. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to assume that we're working maybe around quarter sheet size, which is a pretty common size. And I'm actually not going to get down in the weeds too much with how we might go about choosing individual techniques. The toughest thing for most people is figuring out the painting sequence. And we're going to kind of stay focused on that as far as getting down to the point where you're trying to decide how you want to paint your trees, for example. There are so many videos out there on that sort of thing that I'm just going to leave it to you to choose or use your favorite techniques. And we're going to stay focused more on how do you decide what order to do things in. After the design and size and format are decided, the first step in the actual painting sequence is usually to make some planning marks. Traditionally, this takes the form of an underdrawing. Sometimes there are situations in which you'd rather not see those pencil lines from an underdrawing. And I do have some alternatives for that, but I'm not going to get into that in this video. I'll put it in a later video so that in this video, we can stay focused on trying to figure out a plan and a painting sequence. It helps to start with just some default choices. In watercolor, we generally paint light areas first and layer the darks on top of them. 
We usually start with our soft edged shapes on wet or damp paper and then add our hard edged shapes later as the paper dries. We try to do the biggest shapes first and then layer on top the smaller shapes or make little edges to separate things. And often we do the background and maybe some of the foreground first and put the middle ground where most of the action is on top of that. So that sounds kind of theoretical, so we're going to look at some examples in a moment. But before we do, I just want to make the point that each of these default settings is for a particular spot on the painting. So in any given location, we would do the lighter colors first and layer darker colors on top of them because watercolor is transparent. But that doesn't mean you have to paint every light thing on the whole painting before you're allowed to put some dark, darker marks on your painting. So when you're watching this, you'll see that everything is sort of woven together and all of the different things that we have to make decisions about interact with each other and there are trade-offs. So treat this planning process as kind of like a puzzle that you have to solve. And you come up with a first guess about the solution and if that doesn't work, then you move things around a little bit, try a different sequence, make some adjustments and try again. So let's have a look at how these default settings play out in some simple watercolors. In this painting, after the end of the first wash, we have large, light colored, soft edged shapes, which are mostly background or foreground, the distant sky and the sort of general color in the foreground. Then we layer on top of this a somewhat darker, but still reasonably large shape, still farther in the background of our distant mountains. And this has a hard edge shape at the top, but we soften the lower edge because we're going to layer on top of that with some harder edge shapes again. After that's dry, we come back in with even smaller and darker shapes that are in the middle ground where most of the action is going to be in this painting. So as the painting progresses, you can see that the general strategy has been followed where we did large light shapes that are soft edged first, mostly background and foreground first, and then worked on those smaller dark shapes in the middle ground later. Here's another example of a very different type of painting where after the first wash, we have some light, large, soft edge shapes that will be background and foreground. Next, we come back and create some somewhat smaller, somewhat darker shapes that we layer on top of the previous wash to start to show our viewer where the pair is. And now a layer of even darker color until finally we're doing the smallest, darkest shapes on the main subject. And notice here that we're going to come back and soften part of this edge. So it's not like there's some rule that says you can't soften something later in the painting after you've painted hard edge shapes. But because we're softening an edge that goes over other soft edges, we won't disturb any hard edges. So again, in any particular part of this painting, we did light colors first and layered darker colors on top. We painted soft edges first and layered hard edged shapes on top. If we softened an edge, it was over another soft edge. We did big shapes and then smaller shapes. And we mostly worked on the background and the foreground first and then the middle ground. So you may be sitting there thinking, wait, that's cheating. Those are really simple paintings. Of course they were easy to plan. My paintings are much more complicated. And that might be true. If you're used to painting more complex paintings, either following someone else's step-by-step -step or paint along or by copying photos, and using the outline and fill it in method, then you may need to back up just a little bit and do some simpler paintings to get your head around the planning process. Just because you're a black diamond skier doesn't mean you should go down a black diamond run your very first day on a snowboard. So if you need to do a simpler painting, do that and figure things out a little at a time and add complexity as you get comfortable with this planning process. All right, let's go back to our lighthouse designs, which we wanted to come up with plans for. So let's imagine that we use the default settings and see where we run into trouble. Let's have a look at design one in grayscale so we can think just about values for a moment. 
What if we tried to approach this one pretty much like the first example that we just looked at and paint the sky and the water first soft and wet into wet? We do have some light areas right at the horizon and along the upper parts of the things on the island and then maybe down by the shoreline. And then there are some somewhat lighter areas in the water, but perhaps we could do a little bit of masking on our lighthouse and some of the rocks and then do a first layer, something like this, where we would paint down to that horizon line and the tops of the trees wet into wet, leave a soft edge, and then pick up again with the water and drop in some darker swooshes of color for those wave shapes. And then when that's dry, we could come back and add a somewhat darker layer of smaller shapes on the island and in the reflections, and then some even smaller, darker shapes to kind of finish things off. And that seems like a workable plan until you look at it in color again and realize that there are all these soft edged shapes adjoining each other that are complementary colors. The blue violet of the sky just above the horizon and the tree line is almost a direct complement of the gold in the upper part of the trees and the pale yellow in the distant water. Let's do a little sample to test how this is going to work out, just in that area where we have the top of the tree line and the island and a little bit of the horizon. So I've masked my lighthouse and a little bit of my trees and that leading edge of the rocks and a little down by the water. I've indicated where the main trunks of those first two trees are and I'll just make a shape for the rest. So the plan was we're going to wet the whole page or perhaps you want to just do the sky and then do the water. So you might decide to wet just down to the horizon. I'm gonna go ahead and do the water at the same time. And now I'm going to lay my wash and I've come down the page from up above. And now I want to paint around these trees wet into wet, leaving a light area to fill in with my yellow. And the first challenge to that is, this is gonna be a much bigger wash, so I'm gonna to have to keep this going over here while I'm painting around these tree shapes over here, wet into wet. But maybe I can handle that. And then I'm going to come down. I don't have to worry about the lighthouse. I can paint directly over that. And then I will just sort of let it fade away at the horizon because I want a soft edge there. And then I'm going to pick up below that yellow area in the water and I have to make sure that my little light is left there at the horizon. And then I'll come on down to do the rest of the water and my paper is already drying. So that's another thing that we're going to run into if we try to do this on a large sheet. We're going to have to work quickly to get this whole thing done this is starting to feel pretty challenging. And then we drop in our darker swooshes of color, which would continue on down the page. So that would be our first layer, and now we've got to come back and do our second layer. Okay, so here we are after the first wash is dried, and somehow we have to get our yellow into this area, and just a pale hint of yellow along the horizon, and we want all those things to be soft edge shapes. So how are we gonna pull that off? Well, one option would be to use the methods from my Watercolor Skies Project 1, where we re-wet the entire page very carefully so that we don't disturb our initial wash and pull any of the blue-violet into this area, and then go in and drop in our gold and try not to let it grow out too much. That's probably the only thing we can do that's gonna give us a soft edged pale yellow right here at the horizon because there's no way I'm gonna paint a nice soft yellow line and get back there fast enough to soften the edges with a damp brush. I might be able to pull that off in here. So let's see if I come in here and say, all right, so I'm gonna actually paint my tree kind of paint my trees, and I've got to get back and soften that upper edge, so I better start on that on the first tree now, because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. 
So I'm going around softening that edge. Meanwhile, this is drying. So I better get going over here. And what's going on at the bottom? Maybe we soften that edge too. And I have darker colors to go over here, but I could add those later. So I'm not worried about those so much, but I do need to get back there and soften those edges before they dry. And they already started to dry. So now I have to agitate them a little bit to get them to soften. And the problem with that is this blue violet is starting to move a bit. So as I'm trying to soften this edge, I'm also kind of now that this is dry, I'm sort of pushing this pigment around here. So it's not horrible, but I'm getting this funny little gray line because this gold and this blue violet are almost direct complements. So if you mix them together, together, you get gray. And I have to keep in mind that I made this about three times as big as it's going to be in the finished painting because I wanted you to be able to see it on the video. So I'm really going to need to do all this about <laughs> yay big. And that means that I don't have as much wiggle room as I had here, literally, to come back and soften these edges and not have them move too far. So that's a pretty big challenge. This is a situation that also often shows up in sunrise and sunset paintings. Here we have sort of a salmon pink or sort of orangey clouds against a turquoise sky. Once again, almost direct complements and soft edge light shapes right next to each other. Complementary color schemes are pretty appealing, so you may have encountered this problem before. And if it was making you tear your hair out, don't feel bad, because this happens to be something that is just inherently difficult to handle in watercolor. If you have two soft-edged, especially light shapes that are almost direct complements right next to each other in watercolor, you'll have a problem with how to keep those colors separated and still have the soft edges. In fact, it's a big enough challenge that I'm going to take it all into the next video. And in the next video, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of different options for how you might deal with that situation. So in this video, we're going to leave design one for a while and defer it to the next video and have a look at design two. So design two seemed to be the more complicated of the two designs when we were coming up with them. But now that we've been through the process of trying to come up with a painting plan and you're looking at design two again, you may be seeing it with fresh eyes and thinking, oh, this isn't really that bad. So yes, we might have to go look for some silhouettes of kayakers that we can trace if we want to include the kayakers. And we'll need to mask the light in the lighthouse and the reflections of the light in the water. Maybe spatter some mask for some stars. But otherwise, we can make one big graduated wash for the sky and the water. And then come back and paint all our small dark shapes on top of it, probably in one additional wash. So we actually could probably pull this off with some masking and two washes. I chose these two designs to use as examples because this is pretty common in watercolor to look at something and at first glance think, oh, this painting would be easy and that one would be more difficult. And then when you actually try to come up with a painting plan, you discover it's the other way around. But if you don't realize that that's going on, then sometimes you can think, I can't even paint this easy one. So you're frustrated because you can't do the one you think is easy, that's actually hard. And you're afraid to try the one that looks hard because you figure that'll be even worse. So I hope that now you can look at things with maybe a little bit more um, discerning eye about where there are real challenges and where you might be able to mostly use those default settings to figure out your painting plan. Most of the time when you have to deviate from the default setting, it's because there is some sort of light area or white area that you have to reserve. If that area has hard edges, then masking fluid is often a great way to do it. Or if it's big enough and simple enough, you can paint around it. In the next video, we're going to take up that challenge though of trying to reserve light areas that have soft edges and especially if they have soft edges and they're right next to something that's a complementary color. That's actually a real challenge, so if you have been wrestling with a painting like that and feeling bad, 
don't feel bad. <laughs> it's just inherently difficult in watercolor. But there are some things we can do to try to approach that problem. So in the next video, we'll do that. For this one, I hope you'll take that default setting idea and see if you can use it to come up with a painting plan for some of the paintings that you want to work on. And remember, if you're finding it a little challenging, back off the complexity a little bit from what you're accustomed to and start learning the planning process in a little bit simpler setting. I hope you have fun with it and I'll see you next time. Happy painting.